In 2021, we're lucky to live in a time where the average quality standard of JRPGs is pretty high. Localizations and graphics are better than ever, and more and more gripping stories are being told. And with the PS5 out, we're sure to see things get even better over the years, making the future look very bright if you like playing high quality games. As much as I love these kinds of games, I also don't mind a game with some quirks, and even greatly appreciate games that try their best to do something new, even if it fails, as there's usually some interesting ideas to be found, and a fair few games receiving anime right now reminded me of this recently, with the fact that they're receiving these anime making me think that I'm not the only one. Inspired by these games, I decided to make this video talking about these imperfect JRPGs and more that I was able to fall in love with in spite of their shortcomings, to showcase the good and bad of these titles and why I can't help but still love them anyway. The World Ends With You was a JRPG I always wanted to try thanks to its reputation as a cult classic on the DS, so when it was announced that it would be coming to Switch in its final remix form, it was something I naturally had to pick up. What I didn't think so much about when I was buying it was its controls, with this port on different hardware with different capabilities making its controls on Switch end up being done by either pointing at what you were doing on screen with a single Joy-Con or the touchscreen to make up for the lack of stylus on Switch, which in theory would be similar to DS controls, I guess, but it's still an unusual way to play with a Switch. My preferred way to play Final Remix ended up being by using the touchscreen, which I remember playing on the train with both my Joy-Cons zipped up inside of my Switch case, Switch firmly planted in my hand as I desperately tried to aim all my slash attacks just right while standing on a moving vehicle, which is kind of funny to think about now compared to the comfortable experience of just playing with a controller in other games. So the fact I was always willing to push through and keep my Joy-Cons all packed up in a way says that it was immersive at the very least, and I left the shorter experience thinking more about how good the story was rather than how it played differently to other Switch games. I almost think of this as some of the world ends with you's charm considering everything else in this game too. The characters are all very different individuals, the art of this game is incredibly unique and eye-popping, and controller aside, its use of badges in its battle system makes it stand out in many ways compared to other games, so the different controls don't really feel that out of place when you consider how unique it is overall. In saying that though, I am looking forward to keeping my hands firmly planted on the controller when Neo The World Ends With You comes out, and I'd say the controls aren't something I love or hate about the game, they're just not my preferred way of playing. No matter what form or control scheme you play it with though, it's certainly a story worth playing through and is pretty quick to get through being about 20 hours even with its new final remix content on Switch, and even quicker if you decide to watch its anime that I hope to get back to soon, and it is a story with a lot of unique and style that will be a lot of fun to see continue later this year. An imperfect JRPG that definitely has a special place in my heart has to be Final Fantasy XV, a polarizing Final Fantasy title for most thanks to its departure from many Final Fantasy staples like its change to an active battle system and the fact it replaced its high fantasy worlds with one that just adds fantasy to reality. The fact this game was so hit or miss for people is actually one of the reasons I finally got into making video content though, as I saw how much people were talking negatively about this game I loved so much on YouTube that made me want to be a positive voice for it. And while I don't think I swayed many people to look at the game differently, the fact that it was so special to me says a lot about how I felt about the game as I really loved pretty much everything about it at the time. But hindsight is 2020, and I've played more modern JRPGs and have come to understand what I love about the genre, and from that point of view I can see some flaws in its world that I couldn't fully see through rose-colored glasses at that time. My issue with it isn't that its gameplay is sometimes a bit simplistic, the amount of landmarks compared to other open world games, or how the development cycle took forever since I got addicted to it in spite of those things, but after a few years of having put down this title, I've thought more about how its story was handled, particularly in terms of DLC and extra content, and how much better this world could have been both as a game and in its reputation if it included many of the things it tried to build a universe out of in the one game. Through its movie Kingsglaive, its YouTube anime, and the character DLC episodes that came out after it was released, 
released, it attempted to create hype and law with these extra releases, and yet bar side quests that add more powerful weapons and banta, the story in the game just doesn't give you that many opportunities to dive truly deeper without buying more content and at the time waiting for it to be released. And while I haven't tried the Royal version of 15 since I bought most of the DLC day one, I can only imagine how much nicer it is to have certain character DLC the time some of the party members are absent from the party to know what's going on, or how much better it is to have it in one package from the get-go rather than my experience of waiting for their release and forgetting parts of the story that made them lose some of their impact. I want to be clear that I enjoyed the game and the DLCs for that matter in spite of this as I love the characters and side content, but the fact it could have been better kind of kills me a little, especially with the cherry on top being that some episodes like episode Luna Freya and even episode Noctis were ultimately cancelled, so I feel we'll never truly have an experience that would have brought out the best in everything this world had to offer. It's a story of a game trying to do too much content and capitalizing at the same time in my opinion, but I'll also never discount the fact that I did get really into it, it just lost a lot of its luster when they decided to cut the remaining threads of what was already a spread out story, and I still haven't been able to bring myself to play episode art into this day. But I'm also recording this with a Final Fantasy 15 placemat staring right at me, so I think I definitely feel more good about it than bad. I can only hope Square Enix has learned from this and will give a more fulfilling story experience in 16. And since I enjoyed Final Fantasy 7 Remake a lot, I feel a lot better about their storytelling at the moment. But in any case, 15 is definitely an interesting piece of Final Fantasy history, and I still mostly look back fondly at the adventuring and driving around that I experienced in my journey. Coming back to the type of games I prefer these days, Nelke and the Legendary Alchemist was the anniversary title released by Gust a couple of years ago for the Atelier series' 20th anniversary as a celebratory spin-off game to the main series, Pre-Atelier, Lulua, and Ryza, and featuring the main protagonists from each game before then. It's hard to call this one a JRPG, as its city-building simulation parts are a big part of its gameplay, but its JRPG elements are actually one of the bigger imperfections from this game, so it makes it easy to include in this video, and also, as much as I enjoyed the game, when I think of imperfect games I enjoyed, Nelke is the one that instantly comes to mind. Nelke and the Legendary Alchemist, in my opinion, simply tried to do a little too much with too many alchemists. It wanted to be an Atelier cross simulation game that could manage synthesis being done at over 20 Ateliers at a time, along with giving jobs and events to everyone, providing a new story, all while including gathering and JRPG battles while letting you build your own city, that adds a lot to the Atelier game flow that didn't always work. It pulled off some things really well like the interactions between these Atelier characters, and Nelke has her own interesting relationships that I'm invested enough in to want to pick up the storybook they released that gives them even more backstory. And while the localization wasn't always on its side, it was enjoyable enough that I'm planning to go back to this story once I've finished all the Atelier games eventually. What ended up destroying my brain in this game though was keeping track of all the items I had going in each Atelier when it's massive synthesis system failed me by not telling me when I no longer had enough things to synthesize with, which I think could have been done considering as I play through Atelier Sophie DX, Corneria is constantly able to tell me when I can't afford to have my items refilled anymore, and this top with its gathering elements being extremely simplistic compared to the main games makes this a nice Atelier to have for the story content and to watch it try something different, but it's not what I'd call the most perfect execution compared to how well most Ateliers manage the trident and true Atelier game flow. Atelier has a big trend of improving game by game though, so in three years for its next anniversary, I wouldn't at all be against seeing this spin-off idea get another chance with a little more polish in its newer protagonists, or even something different entirely. There are lots of fun ideas in this game though, and I still enjoyed it enough to pick it up for a little bit after I played Yakuza Like a Dragon and was left with a simulation bug from its mini games. so while Nelke definitely isn't a perfect spin-off game, it's certainly not one I'm to have in my collection. As another game that's receiving an anime at the moment, Blue Reflection is another JRPG I have a lot of love for. Unlike The World Ends With You Final Remix, it features a much more conventional control and battle system that make it have fun turn-based gameplay complete with magical girl flair thanks to the stunning and pretty art style by Mel Kishida. Most of all, it tells an interesting story about exploring emotions, with both protagonist Hinako's power as a magical reflector and being able to explore girls' emotions that make it a memorable JRPG story that I 
I love their exploring more in the current anime and in future Blue Reflection games. I don't have a lot to complain about for Blue Reflection as I really do love it so much, but when I was thinking about the next one, I find myself hoping it fixes a few things that made it feel repetitive. In both this game and another Gus game, Atelier Lydian Soul, that came out around the same time, Gus seemed to like this idea of having a certain amount of listed conditions being done before moving on to the next activity. But the difference between Blue Reflection's version and Lydian Soul's is that it just seemed unrealistic that the other reflectors, Lime and Yuzu, would literally give Hinako a point system for every single thing she does between missions, with other versions like Lydian Soul's more matching up with their goals that made it feel not so tacked on. Additionally, the localization had a few typos and whatnot at the time that I haven't checked on in a while, but I remember were a little distracting. Although to give credit where it's due, since Ryza, I've enjoyed most Gus localizations since, so they've definitely improved, but adding it on top of the feeling of repetitiveness definitely gives it room for improvement in the next one. What I love about Gus is how often they try something new though, and Blue Reflection is certainly no exception with its combination of story genres and gameplay ideas that make it easily one of my favorite games I've reviewed for this channel. And the fact that Gus has improved so much since then has me incredibly excited to see what they'll have to offer in Blue Reflection Second Light and in the rest of the anime when I finally get back to it. This title is one I've covered more recently, so I don't want to go too in-depth on my feelings about it, but Seven Nights Time Wanderer was a game that both ended up being incredibly innovative thanks to the way it used simple controls to its advantage, but was also let down by its localization that unfortunately makes it hard to recommend to everyone. I really liked that you can explore the world through its board that features surprises like side quests and the way it puts more of an emphasis on timing when you use attacks rather than the amount of them, but the thing that kept me from coming back to it to complete my social events is its localization that can be really good in some sections and quite literal and strange in others, usually at points where you need to give a dialogue option which is in the character events, so some characters I'll probably never know as much as I'd like to. The reason I wanted to mention it here again, aside from perfectly fitting into the theme of this list, is that it's also a game I'd love to see more of if they could get this right in future, and like the other games has plenty of good points and potential in other areas like its time traveling main story and challenging special battles system that shows there's a fun game in there to be enjoyed if you can get past these things. So while this smartphone spinoff was imperfect, I'm still happy with how much it impressed me this year, and being yet another one of these games that happens to have an anime out at the moment, it has been nice to watch it in a more visually polished form. So whether it's through the show or in another game in future, I'm looking forward to playing catch up with it when I watch more of it soon, and I hope it helps us perhaps see more and better things from this series in future, as I still think it has a lot more interesting stories to tell. Thank you for watching this video, let me know in the comments below what your favorite imperfect JRPGs are and if you've played any of the games off my list. You can like and share this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe to my channel for more JRPG content like this, and ring that bell to get notifications on whenever I post so you don't miss a thing. You can check out more videos here and you can find me on social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram all at JRPG Jungle. Links to those will be in the description below and until next time, thank you, bye!